It's interesting to come to New York from comfortable California where you come in a heat wave and get frostbite. Uh, sitting in these rooms, I hope we get some motion around here, perhaps some uh, excitement. Uh, I want to thank Marcy and Rich and others. I wasn't at the last uh, Terrytown meeting, but I've been working with Rich uh, on this project for a number of years. I'm going to be rather rapid in what I'm going through today, and I apologize. The slides will be available. Um, and I know that some of the things I'm going to be talking about are uh, somewhat new to, to people here. They're not in the heart of what we usually think about with biotechnologies. Uh, if this works, it's going to be like a bullet train going very quickly through things. If it doesn't, it'll be like Amtrak. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be very concrete and focus on this example of organ transplantation. Uh, we've had some very excellent introduction to the, the general principles, um, and I'm going to try to give some specific things. I'm going to try to talk about five things, give you a little background on why organ transplantation is a reasonable topic for us to talk about, the initial efforts uh, to bring ethics to it, both nationally and globally, uh, that have left us with a good deal of improvement in the field, but still a spreading stain uh, of unethical practices, and then I'll conclude by looking at some of the remaining challenges. So why talk about organ transplantation? Well, since the early 1950s, organ transplantation has saved millions of lives, uh, and in that context, the major ethical issue is an issue of justice, um, which is in access to the procedure on an individual level and social justice, the question, are, are we focusing on the right thing? Are we looking, for example, at the social determinants of health that bring about a lot of the organ failure, particularly kidney failure, uh, in, uh, in many societies? Now, it, it's also an issue, obviously, that raises questions because of the unique uh, resource, human organs for transplantation are uh, a scarce resource and they involve us with deceased donors and the question of living donors. Uh, the sale of organs has become really a disgrace to this noble legacy and here are some pictures uh, from uh, India, from the Philippines, from Pakistan uh, of people showing their scars on their flanks. These are people who have sold their organs, and now the scar is really a stigma uh, that sets them apart um, and uh, limits their lives. So some of the initial efforts to stop organ sales began in the 1980s, began in the 1960s in the West. For example, uh, in the United States, our Uniform Anatomical Gift Act goes back to 1968, treating organs as a gift, not a commodity. Uh, the issue became an, uh, an issue in the United States in 1983 where, when a, a doctor in Virginia said he wanted to set up a program to bring people mostly from Latin America here who would get money for their organs and it would solve the problems. There was a very rapid uh, instance of um, uh, participatory democracy, as it were, uh, uh, governing science here, bipartisan action, the National Organ Transplant Act absolutely forbade uh, any person to knowingly acquire, receive, or otherwise transfer any human organ for valuable consideration, which is lawyer speak for money, basically. Um, and it also took a positive step of addressing the shortage by setting up the Organ Transplant Network, which is contracted to a group called UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing. And uh, this began to move at the global level uh, through WHO, which is the UN Specialized Agency for Health, but beyond its uh, existence in promoting cooperation, it precisely underlines a human rights focus. And here we have the right to health, which is the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health which is in the, the uh, WHO constitutions. And the effort began in 1987, where some of the practices, particularly in developing countries, came to the attention of the World Health Assembly. 
and uh, in a resolution in that year and two years later, the, the WHO consistently took a stand against any form of organ sales. Finally, in 1991, as a result of the process that began four years earlier, uh, a document called the Guiding Principles, uh, these, boil, these were nine principles, they boiled down into four points, a preference for deceased over living donation, a preference for, relive, live, for related over unrelated uh, living donors, uh, any selling or buying of organs was forbidden, and informed voluntary consent for all donations. This was, in effect, an improvement but not a cure because it really is only soft law. The guiding principles tell states what they ought to do. It did produce some good consequences. Uh, about 50 countries adopted laws in conformity with the guiding principles. But centers in other countries that hadn't adopted the laws began doing organ transplantation and advertising for foreign recipients. Um, either they lacked or they didn't enforce uh, prohibitions. And I'm going to skip through this very quickly, but basically over the last eight years what happened was a return, a re-examination of the process of the guiding principles. And in 2010, the adoption of a somewhat expanded set of guiding principles that takes into account more about cells and tissue transplantation and adds two principles. The principle number 10 is on increasing safety of the materials being transplanted, and number 11 about organizational transparency. And this is an example of guiding principle 5. It says that cells, tissues, and organs should only be donated freely. Uh, so what's the, the situation today? Transplantation is not limited to a few developed countries. It occurs in over 90 countries around the world. Um, in 2009, there were more than 100,000 organ transplants. There are probably more because not all countries have great records. This is about a 4% increase over the previous year, but it's only about 10% of the need is being met. Um, so what are the opportunities for uh, for addressing the problem. Well, parse, the first challenge is that there are now forces, particularly Dr. Sally Sattel of the American Enterprise Institute, who are claiming that the market is, is the right way to close the gap. The claim is really false, and we have to confront this. It isn't true just on utilitarian grounds. The payment will drive out volunteers. We know that where it's permitted, there is little altruistic donation, and if there's been a deceased donation program, it basically withers. Uh, it doesn't promote autonomy. The people who sell organs are the same people who sell their children. These, these are people who are acting out of desperation, and they're soon back economically where they started and almost universally regret having made the sales which stigmatize them. Uh, and there's also, of course, the problem of injustice because the, it's the poor who are the sellers, not the recipients. On this chart, let, the, the point of looking at this chart is if you look here, you see that the U.S. and Spain are on the high end. This is total transplants of kidneys. And down at the other end is the Philippines, and the blue line is Turkey. Now, if we look at living donors, that switches around. The blue line Turkey is now way over on the right. Uh, the U.S. is there, but Spain has moved down because Spain has very few living donors, has a fabulous deceased donor program. Um, and the, the, um, the Philippines are also very high. Why? Because they're selling their organs to uh, transplant tourists. The second opportunity would be the adoption of hard law. And here I have to say that we have had some success. Pakistan and the Philippines have cut way back with laws. Singapore, which was, is a big haven for medical tourism, people going to get artificial hips and so forth, um, really was on the brink of adopting a law which would have created an incentive because it was going to give a flat compensation, the compensation supposedly for expenses, but in fact, if you come from Malaysia and you come there, you have very low expenses, you're not losing a high paying job away from your work, uh, and it really is just an inducement. And where the problem is particularly severe is places like China where the government is directly involved and executed prisoners are used. If, if, if you arrive in China for an organ transplant and your blood is typed, that message goes to a prison. They find a matching prisoner, and that uh, prisoner is soon your organ, quote, donor. 
Now this leads some people to think that another way would be to create a treaty and Laurence was very, she put this challenge to us and I'm gonna answer this. I, I think it may be possible in the European context but our experience with cloning is a reminder of the difficulty of doing it at the UN. I was at WHO when we did the, the, the framework convention on tobacco control uh, and that took uh, five very arduous years, millions and millions of dollars, and a lot of uh, arm twisting. I do not see an incentive to do that on organ transplantation right now. I think there are other mechanisms that already exist. The UN Office on Drugs and Crimes has reported to the Conference of the Parties on the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime that trafficking in persons encompasses tracking in organs. So we can use mechanisms that do already exist that are hard law. A much more effective means of uh, addressing the challenge of achieving more utility, respect for persons and justice, lies in a broadly based movement. And here, this is, uh, it's essential that this movement have an ongoing aspect. It's not enough to have a declaration um, and have considerable leverage over people. And I offer as the example, the Declaration of Istanbul put together by the International Society of Nephrology and the Transplantation Society uh, in May 2008. The results published in the Lancet. Now a group called the Declaration of Istanbul Custodian Group is interacting with governments around the world, uh, professional associations, limiting attendance uh, speeches at meetings to people who um, are conforming to the declaration, going to drug companies that sponsor research and saying don't sponsor research in places where the organs used in the research are purchased, and we're getting an amazing amount of cooperation on this. So, and the final effective means of addressing these challenges, I think, is scientific and technical. First, of course, assisting countries in prevention of organ failure. Second, developing fair and equitable national systems for uh, obtaining and distributing organs, and finally creating new means to treat organ failure, such as with stem cell therapy, which I know leads us around to another set of our concerns. So I leave you with that challenge. Thank you. Okay.